So I will go to the presentation. Uh, I'm going to talk about deployment pipelines in Spinnaker. Um, and uh, we've been using Spinnaker for maybe six or eight months now. And uh, we have done so many pull requests and patches that we are actually rated as a contributor on Spinnaker. Um, so I will tell you a little about, bit about what we've learned and uh, what this tool is. Uh, in the beginning, I will go through some facts, a lot of slides, just defining pipelines and this stuff, and then we'll get into a demo where you can uh, see stuff and ask questions and this stuff. So I hope you want to ask some questions. Uh, I'm a Norwegian, 33 years old. I have three children, and I work in the infrastructure platform delivery team in Shipstead. And I have uh, a GitHub account and also a mail account. <laughs> yeah. And Keybase now. So, yeah, it's quite awesome. Um, in the team I'm working in, we are four people, four developers. So, we are doing everything, like from writing cloud formation, setting up infrastructure stuff, and uh, working in the application level and doing on-call and support. Uh, we own four components in Shipstead. Uh, the first thing is the build service. Uh, that's handled by Travis. We, we run our own Travis uh, on, um, on our own setup. Uh, we have the bake service, where we bake AMIs for uh, um, AV. AVS or uh, Docker containers. And we have the storage service, and that's uh, for storing artifacts like uh, RPMs, DEBs, JAR files, Python, gem files, whatever, and Docker containers. And we have the deliver responsibility, and that's uh, deployments and pipelines and this stuff. So what is Spinnaker? Spinnaker is not only a deployment tool. It, it is also a platform for managing microservices in the cloud. That means you can get an overview for, uh, about the runtime environment that your application is running in. So, so it's not just executing the tasks. It's also watching the infrastructure and uh, it lets you browse it and see stuff about your infrastructure. What's the cloud? Uh, we have one cloud here, and we have some other small uh, clouds like uh, the Google Cloud, AVS, uh, and you have the on-premise kind of cloud, OpenStack, uh, and you have Kubernetes, and uh, Spinnaker also supports Azure, Cloud Foundry, and Titus, and Titus is uh, um, a layer on top of Mesos that they're running in Netflix. So Spinnaker has bindings to all of these cloud providers, and, uh, and uh, you can add cloud providers to Spinnaker as well, if you have some other cloud. So Spinnaker is a platform, and it consists of several services. So we have, uh, in our setup, we have eight of the services running. And there is more, more uh, services, but these are the ones we are running. And this is DEC, is the front end. It's a thin web application just served by uh, Apache. And uh, Gate is the aggregated API in Spinnaker. And that's the only, you have the, the thin front end layer, and everything you do is. Uh, talking with the gate that um, directs the calls to the other components within Spinnaker. Roscoe is the bakery, where you create Docker containers or AMIs, or uh, uh, you can also bake <coughs> for OpenStack or Google Cloud. Igor is the CI integration. So Spinnaker currently integrates uh, against uh, Travis and Jenkins for CI. 
and it also uh, integrates against GitHub and um, Stash, and that's done in Igor. And it's also Igor also uh, ships events on uh, Docker events, Docker registry events. We have Front 50. That's a storage service. It's storing all your pipeline definitions and all your pipeline executions. Echo is an event bus, so it listens to events and uh, emits events. <laughs> or it has an API to collect events and then it ships it. Uh, Orca is uh, the orchestrator. So when, when you're executing something in your pipeline, the Orca is the one orchestrating, picking stuff from CI, uh, running it out to the cloud or triggering a bake or whatever. Um, cloud driver is the component that talks to all the various kinds of clouds and also Eureka and and um, the console, I think. Yeah, yeah, it's true. So it seems kind of big with eight services. Why are there so many services? Uh, that's because Every service has its own responsibility. So uh, when we started out using Spinnaker, we actually only used the bakery. We started with that several months before we started using the complete system. And because it has a well-known API and it's a separate service, we could launch this and use the bakery part without using any of the other components within Spinnaker. So that shows that you can opt into the various parts of it. Uh, and some people wonder if this requires a lot of resources uh, and uh, because it seems big with the eight services. But uh, I have proof here that it can run on two Raspberry Pis. And that means you can probably run eight uh, uh, Spinnaker clusters on your development machine. So it's not that resource heavy. So a common thing is uh, people asking if it can replace the CI server or is, if it's uh, the same thing as a CI server, but it's not. It does not aim to run, execute builds and this kind of stuff. It will use the CI systems to run script tasks and Maven builds or whatever you have. And uh, you, uh, the various CI systems are good in this space where they are not so good is to trigger jobs and have dependencies and handle pipelines and this stuff. And they're not integrated against the various clouds. So why Spinnaker? Um, as I said earlier, it uh, integrates against various systems. So, so if you have special if you have a CI system, you can integrate Spinnaker to that CI system that you're already using. And if you move to a different CI system, you can still use the same, same um, pipeline system. And it, it connects to the various clouds. So if you're moving from one AVS account to another or to Kubernetes from AVS or whatever, you can use the same pipeline system to do this and have the same experience across the various integrations. And there's a lot of things we gain by doing this because when we have Spinnaker connected to all our AVS accounts, we can actually know what AMIs are running in every account. And if there is some sort of security threat, we have bake logs for all these AMIs and we can see what, what the SSH version is running on every host and we can search and find places we need to upgrade without without go logging into every machine. And it's easy to handle multiple runtime environments. Like I said earlier, running in Kubernetes, AVS, or whatever, it's easy to maintain in Spinnaker. So what's a pipeline? Uh, a pipeline usually consists of uh, a build, CI build, a uh, bake step, that's if you're running immutable infrastructure, you need this either to create a Docker container or a 
image to run in the cloud. Uh, but if you're not, you're usually running on uh, on a mutable infrastructure. You might skip the bake stage, and then you deploy to the test environment, and then you run some tests against it, and you deploy to production. So. I will get back to deployment, yeah. yeah. Deployment, so what's the most important thing for a deployment? To me, it's the state of the deployment that you know my application has started deploying, it's now deploying, and it's done deploying, and it failed, or it succeeded. That I know I can trace the entire deployment. Many times, you, if you trigger a bash script that just runs it, you know that the deployment has started, but you don't actually know that it's successful or unsuccessful. And this is, to me, a very important part in the pipeline. And you need to trust this part. And when you deploy, you should be able to roll back, no matter what. So uh, you might have healthy instances, but you need to be able to roll back and quite fast. Uh, you need to be able to deploy often so that your the, um, the changes you are deploying are only a few changes, not the big change set, so that you can actually trace what's going on when something's wrong. And it needs to be automated, and it needs to have no down downtime. A build, that's for some, some languages, there's no compile step, but most languages you need to compile. Uh, then you run unit tests to test that your code works OK. And then you can verify test coverage or verify the code styles. And then you, the uh, important part is to upload the artifact to a central repository so that you can fetch it whenever you, you want. A bake, this is to create a Docker container or uh, a, a AMI or cloud image. Yeah. Um. So there's basically two kinds of deployments I will go through. One of them is the immutable infrastructure deployment, where you have a completely new image, and you create, uh, deploy that. Then you can deploy a new group, server group, with this image running in, so that you have the old cluster running just as before, and you just launch new stuff that you start testing on, and then put into load. And then you can turn off the load to the old version if the new version is working OK, and uh, scale it down or delete it. Uh, old school deployment works a little bit different, because then, then you have a given set of uh, iron, maybe 20 servers, and you need to deploy to them while still running. So, so usually you remove some of the servers from load, and uh, from the load balancer, and you deploy the code, and then you reinsert them to load and, and uh, go through the other half. Yeah, this is done. So, next step in the pipeline after deployment is integration tests. And it's very important when you have integration tests that you run them against uh, actual de the deployed version of your um, application, and that you're not running it like in Maven, you can start Jetty and run tests against it. But that's not really the same thing as having a deployed version of the code to test against. So for integration tests, it's important that this is chained behind the deployment of that application, so that you actually know that you're testing the application as it would run in production. Performance tests, it's the same thing. Uh, running performance tests within your build when you're starting the application in the build reactor is not the same thing as running it in the cluster that is production-like. Manual ver verification is just a uh, ability I think it's important to have in a pipeline that you can have as top human kind of step that you 
say that this is ready for production or not. If you have automated tests and everything is okay, it's okay to roll out automatically, but in many cases it's uh, nice to have manual verification, at least when you're starting out with pipelines. So deployment to production is pretty much the same as uh, deployment to test environments, but you can deploy to a subset of your users and instrument the applications and performance and see and have a slightly different rollout, a more data-driven rollout. So Spinnaker depends on Redis or and S3 or Cassandra to save your um, S3 and Cassandra is used to save the save the pipeline definitions and also the pipeline executions while all the rest of the data is stored in Redis. So it's really, it's a live cache kind of thing. Yeah, we've gone through this. So I thought I would show you guys a little bit about how Spinnaker actually looks and feels when we're using it. Okay, so this is the pipeline view for our application. This is Spinnaker Igor. This is the application that integrates against Travis or Jenkins and the various GitHub and Stash stuff. Uh, this list here is uh, a list of uh, uh, executions of this pipeline. Um, you can see here that it's triggered. Triggered build, that means that uh, this pipeline has been triggered by a build in the CI system. If we press the link here, we get into the concrete build in the Travis that triggered the pipeline. So at the end of this build, we are uploading a Debian package. This is maybe a little bit small. This Debian package is uploaded, and when this pipeline is being triggered, it picks the Debian packages uploaded in the build and uses those concrete versions when it's doing the bake. So the bake here will bake an AMI using the artifact uploaded in the CI build. So when a bake runs, we have uh, we we watch it in Spinnaker. It will be blue while it's running and red if it's uh, a bad bake and uh, green if it's a green bake, uh, successful bake. Um, and this AMI we created here will be forwarded to the deployment stage. So when we do a deployment, this is a uh, red-black deployment. It's the same as blue-green, but only in Spinnaker language. Um, uh, here we can see the various steps. So what's, what happens when, when we, uh, we deploy is that we launch a new auto scaling group in uh, AVS, and we follow this. It uh, determines the source server group. It, uh, eventually starts launching or creating the new server group and then it follows that the instances gets healthy before it moves on. So in this view we can follow the actual deployment as it happens. It's not like I'm deploying and I'm done and it was good. It, we can see the details about the actual 
deployment. And that's very handy when it goes wrong because you can see what, what, why did the deployment go bad. Um, when we look at the pipeline, I think I will show you another pipeline that is a little bit more exciting to look at the configuration on. And Ant Antonio is here, so it's, uh, it's the best uh, best pipeline to look at for. So this pipeline has the same start. It's it's got a configuration where it listens to a uh, Travis job. It uh, has a bake, and it deploys to dev. But what happens here is that it's fanning out to three different tasks at once. One is manual judgment. Is this ready for production? So if I run this pipeline and I just press, yes, it's ready for production, this won't be deployed to production before the docker bake tests work, are green, and uh, the AMI bake test is green. So we can go from one to many and back to one line again in the pipeline. And, and this is quite powerful. And it's quite easy to set up. I um, can show you how it looks. If I wanted to start deploying this to Kubernetes, for instance, I could just create a new bake, select Docker, say it's trusty. This at the stage, I would maybe name this Docker. Oh, yeah. This stage is a deployment, add server group, Kubernetes. No, I don't have a server group from before, but then, then I. Uh, Now, now I suddenly have two roads for this pipeline, and I could I could just set this one to be dependent on uh, the deploy, and in order to deploy to dev, it it uh, had to work all the way here. Manual judgment. <laughs> yeah. So this pipeline now would bake an AMI while deploying, baking and deploying to Kubernetes. And these are requirements before it could deploy to dev. So you can play around and uh, compose pipelines very easily in Spinnaker. Um, these tests are running tests in the CI system. And they are not, they are triggering a separate pipeline for running these tests. So this stage is actually a pipeline triggered within the pipeline. Um, and this uh, sub pipeline, or what it's called, is, um, is uh, running the jobs in in um, Travis using the CI to run actual tests against the uh, deployed code. Okay, so now now I think I've shown you a little bit about uh, um, the rich configuration of, of pipelines. So you can see that it's it's quite free within Spinnaker to create your own flows and. You're unable to run tests when you want it, and you can set the requirements for deploying to production and such. So let's look at the other part of Spinnaker, and that's the part where you manage your cloud. Um, because when when you're using Spinnaker to to deploy and bake and all the things, you can look at your 
clusters that are running in uh, in the various accounts. And I'll just uh, and then you have all the information about the cluster that is running. You can see it was created the 27th of October. This is today. Uh, it's running in the US. It's healthy. It's got one instance, uh, instance type, uh, and so on. And you can see what package and what Travis build that actually produced the artifact that is running in in production. So if I go here, I can see the log for the build in Travis that produced the AMI that I'm running in production. And that's quite powerful if you're debugging stuff and you, you don't know actually what's running there. You have all the metadata inside the cluster management part of Spinnaker to go and search for what's going on. Um, and also, if you have like a flaky instance or some strange thing going on in one instance, you can find data like the IP addresses and shut it down from the ELB or remove it from service discovery and this stuff. So it enables you to work with your infrastructure and see, look at your infrastructure within the same system that you're using for handling the pipelines and deployments. Are there any questions about this? Anything you want to see here? Yes? Uh, is there any way to configure this flow as a port control? Is it port control meta? Or you have to go to the UI or it's... Yeah. Uh, the, um, I will show you a little bit. Um, you can do it now. Uh, the pipeline is represented as JSON already, but it's quite a lot of JSON. So uh, we are currently working uh, on a Kubernetes setup in Shipstead. And what I think we'll try to do here with pipeline as code is that in Kubernetes you can have quite, it's, it's a lot of fields to fill, but a lot of them will be common, so we could uh, define some kind of generator that has simple steps and then generates this JSON. And, and uh, also in the roadmap for Spinnaker now, there is a um, Git-backed uh, pipeline storage. That means basically that you have it as code. And uh, yeah, so there, there is a lot of things going on in that space, but you could just push to the API this JSON right now. But uh, that would be kind of something you create yourself. But the, everything is API, so you're free to do it. But it's a little bit hard right now, I think. And there is some third parties that has created this uh, service that does this for you. You have all the pipelines defined in one repository, I think, and then it works. Yes. Was there another question? So you build the Kubernetes cluster after the pipeline. Like when you deploy, you build a, you build a Kubernetes cluster, or you push to. Uh, the, uh, the Kubernetes cluster yeah. will be running. Some, running some 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 other team or in infrastructure will create a Kubernetes cluster, and we connect Spinnaker to this using the cloud driver, and we only. If you set up a pipeline, you control the applications you're running on top of Kubernetes. Yeah, so Kubernetes <coughs> uh, doesn't run on Spinnaker itself. No, no, it, uh, it's uh, Spinnaker just talks to the APIs. Yeah. I see. Yes. In an earlier slide, uh, you said that the integration test that targets the system that you are building. Is there yeah. any you know, introspection or whatever, or is just arbitrary definition of what tests are influenced by what? components that the programmer does. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's why 
uh, I can show you this. Uh, I, I'm, I said that this in this application I run the uh, integration tests as a separate pipeline. And that's because we have two tracks to deploy to our test environment. We have one for feature branches and one for uh, master, like the production pipeline. So both the feature branch deploy tests, runs the integration tests, and also the, um, the, um, <laughs> the master pipeline, yeah. So I can, it's probably easy to just create a demo of this. I'll do it in dev. So, uh, new pipeline, uh, my tests. So, in this pipeline, we can say that uh, we run the wait stage. You say, this is my tests. This is, this could be a CI job, right? So, this sleeps for five seconds. And then we could create a new pipeline that is um, um, uh, my service. And uh, it's, of course, uh, deploys. Deploy, add stage, and then we execute. After the deployment, we execute. Uh, uh, we execute the uh, my tests pipeline, right? Um, and then you have yet another pipeline that is uh, the dependency you have or something uh, lower. Uh, a, a service that my service is talking to. And if I have the dependency pipeline, um, I would just do like this and trigger The tests. So, so now, if I have a lot of things here, this is uh, so I have my service. If I execute this pipeline, of course, uh, my test needs to run. So here it will probably take five seconds to deploy this application, and then it should trigger my tests. Then it should trigger my tests. So this is probably running and just waiting in background. This should complete in some seconds. Yeah, this has run. Um, and it was green. So this is the usual kind of thing. I change my service and my tests are run. That's no big deal. But when you have the dependency, the underlying service or a service from another team or whatever, you can tell them to run your tests on deploys as well. And then they suddenly run your tests while they're testing, deploying new stuff. And then you get early feedback on adders coming from teams that are not your own dependent services. And I think this is very powerful and this shows how you could just uh, set up uh, tests that actually makes you safer while doing it. If you wanted to solve this in a regular use case, you would probably be doing cron job, cron jobs, running tests every hour or so. But here you can actually do it and correlate it to actual um, an actual deployment of a uh, uh, service you're dependent of. Because you can see here, or maybe you can't see this, 
but you can see that my test, this is triggered by the dependency pipeline and this is from my service pipeline. And if this was read, I would know that something happened in this pipeline that made uh, my, made my uh, test fail. So it's traceable. If I get you right, the nodes of your dependency graph are pipelines. So basically you express every dependency as a pipeline and then you concatenate them. If, if uh, it depends. This, in this case, if you have a set of tests that are integration tests, you could depend, uh, define it as a separate pipeline so that others could run your tests. And that's useful, useful if, if you're highly dependent of, on some other service. Yeah. Yes, are there any more questions about this? Yes? Just to be clear, so you can so define your own launch configuration yeah, you can do it in Spinnaker. You can create uh, auto scaling groups and you can uh, create load balancers and security groups and this stuff. Uh, and there's also a flag in Spinnaker to disable this feature. Uh, so you can choose whether you want to expose this for your users or not. Uh, we recommend to just use Spinnaker to. Um, deploy your applications while you're using CloudFormations or Pataform or something like that to actually build your infrastructure. This can be. Yes. Okay. Um, if there's no more questions here, I will just uh, continue with the presentation. Is there many ABS users here? So I will go quickly through the bakery part of Spinnaker. This is the Rosco component and it, it has an API and the API is quite simple. Uh, you can choose what base AMI to bake upon. And this can be, uh, you can define it in the, as a concrete AMI ID or you can uh, uh, use one of the base AMIs provided in the endpoint. So Ubuntu or Amazon Linux is provided there. And the interface to do stuff with those uh, AMIs is just a list of packages you want to install. So you have a list, you, have a, you choose what to bake, what kind of AMI to bake upon, and then you give a list of Debian packages or RPMs, and that's the only things you have to say about creating your instances. And this sounds pretty crazy for me at least, or it sounded crazy for me when, uh, when I was coming from Puppet and Ansible and this stuff to create very rich uh, AMIs and uh, suddenly I could just provide a Debian package or a RPM and, and that seems quite strange. But um, actually it's very powerful because it shows me, showed me at least how little you actually need to run your application and how simple it can be because there is really not much, much to it. It's like for a Java application in our case, we need logging, centralized logging, centralized metrics, the Java runtime and the application itself. It's only four things, but uh, I've seen a lot of Puppet code to do those four things, and it gets uh, cleaner with, uh, with this simple API. So, what's the powers of using an API like this instead of using pa Packer directly? Uh, you can, if you have instances running as a bakery, you, you always have them up and running. So, you, there's no need to launch a new instance to do the bake. So in our case, we are using the CH root bakery, bakery part, and that just mounts the snapshot from, the, uh, from ABS 
and it installs your packages on top of that, and then it creates a new snapshot that is your AMI. And that goes a lot faster because you're not booting the new instance, and you shave off a lot of time by doing that. Um, we also have like layered bakes, and that means that we can have a, a base AMI where we have the uh, JDK installed, we have the logging installed, and we have the uh, metrics collection installed. And then we only install our application on top of this. So the bake is only installing one package. It's not in setting up the entire machine. And that shades off uh, quite some time on the bakery part. Oh. Um, and we have incremental bakes. Means you're just running up to get upgrade on the machine you already have there. So it only updates the packages that requires updates. So from our findings, it's like uh, this is not uh, entirely true anymore. Gosh. But uh, it takes a EBS bake usually uses about uh, twice the time of a regular CH root bake. So the numbers here are a little bit wrong. I think we have about four four minutes for CH root bakes, and I think it's about uh, eight minutes for a EBS bake. So we've added the Docker support or improved the Docker support in the bakery in Spinnaker. Uh, and that's because if you're moving to from ABS to Kubernetes, it would be nice to have the same flow, flow as you go. So you can deploy to both Kubernetes and ABS in parallel and don't do too many changes at the same time. So I think in time, when we are going to move runtime environments, we will be able to do that using the bakery and bake both the AMI and the Docker container in parallel. And I think many of our users will go uh, over to just create the Docker container in the CI system. But it's nice to have this smooth kind of transition way to go over to um, Docker-based runtimes. So we've talked a, a lot about the capabilities of the orchestration, but I've not gone into details about deployment strategies. I think I'll just quickly show how the deployment configuration looks. So uh, this is where you set up the deployments. There's a lot of fields, but uh, one important part is this one, where you have the strategy. So you can choose uh, Highlander to only have one thing. And uh, the one we usually use is uh, Redback, and you can have custom strategies. That means you can create your own strategies as pipelines. and it will show up here as uh, one of the <coughs> strategies you can choose. Uh, what we do here is we can se select, I think these two are quite important. It's uh, The first one is that uh, when you have deployed the new server group, are you going to scale and scale down the instances to zero instances? That means that the old cluster will be empty. So if you roll back, you need to launch or scale up the cluster before you can uh, roll back. Uh, so for this application, we are not scaling it down. But uh, for some of them, we are doing this. But if you don't scale down, the old version will not get traffic, but it will be very fast to roll back. It's basically, if you're using uh, load balancers, it's the time it takes to add, insert, uh, instances to the load balancer that is your rollback time. And this uh, is how many server groups you want to leave. So m how many versions of my application do I want to have running so that I can roll back? And that's like, if you have four, you can roll back four versions of your applications very fast. 
Then you can select the instance type and a lot of uh, settings. Small question. Yeah. So here we're talking about instances, Amazon, Amazon instances. But if we're talking about Kubernetes, we're talking about ports. Yeah, I can show you Kubernetes. Um, this is the one. So in Kubernetes, there's a lot fewer, fewer uh, capabilities. This is all. I meant that it was more settings here. <coughs> I, I think I need to show you that afterwards, but the, um, the, the point is that this form looks completely different. So it's, it's like tailored for Kubernetes. It's not the same things. In ABS, there's a lot of concepts, while in Kubernetes, there's a smaller subset. Um. Yes. Whoa. So I should show you this as well. So in um, <coughs> in um, in the UI, you have um, um, project dashboard where you can have like all your pipelines and everything connected to your team or your project. Um, and I will I will describe how this these things go down to the various auto scaling groups and such so you have a project that that's your top level project in my team we have spinnaker as a top level project with uh, the different applications are the different spinnaker applications and every application can have several clusters and a cluster is uh, like uh, maybe running in Europe and one in US, so, that's a, so one application can run in several clusters. And within these clusters, you can have several versions of your application. So going from a project, there's quite a few steps down to the concrete instances, because instances is actually below the service groups again, server groups. So there is many layers. So if you're looking at an instance, you would be here. Uh, if you're looking at the pipeline, you would be here in the application. Um, yeah. So this is the relationships inside Spinnaker. So one server group is one version of your service. One cluster is one or more server groups. It's uh, like I told you earlier, it can be um, in the US West or US West and it can contain several versions of your application. Application groups. It can have several clusters, and one applications, application can consist of one or more services. And projects are one or more application group. So there's, it should scale <laughs> to uh, many teams and uh, many applications and ser services. So the Spinnaker experience so far for us has been uh, Setting it up, it's, uh, 
it's been um, quite a long journey actually to set it up properly. So getting the bakery up was one job and then uh, rolling it out to the organization and uh, understanding the entire setup. It takes a little while. Uh, we've been running it for six or eight months now and and we have not had many issues with it. We have some quirks now and then, but uh, we haven't uh, had any big ones, I think. Um, when internet was down last Friday, Spinnaker also went down a little bit, of course, but it uh, auto-recovered, so it was a nice uh, experience. Uh, we've been contributing uh, quite a lot to the project upstream, and that's been a nice experience. The, the guys in the central Spinnaker team are quite fast and responsive on PRs and questions. The, the support is actually better than some of the other support channels I've used. Uh, when I ask in the public Slack channel for Spinnaker about issues and stuff like that, people jump in very fast and uh, you get like the core developers to respond quite quick. So it's, you, you learn stuff quickly and you get fast answers. Um, yes, so it feels good to be working with Spinnaker. It's like any other service. The, the strange part is the configuration. They're using Jamul in the configuration, and they're using it in quite a inheritance-based way. So, so uh, if you're going to set up Spinnaker, you should try to learn or read the configuration, the Jamul files in the config uh, directory a little bit first, because there is like this Eureka uh, moment there you see why <laughs> why things work yeah. so you can get the code and documentation on spinnaker.io uh, you can they have a slack channel you can ask questions on stack overflow or you can post github issues when you're working with spinnaker so there's many inter interaction points So, I hope you've seen that Spinnaker is a platform for continuous delivery of microservices in the cloud. That is more than just deployments as well. It, it helps you get an overview of the runtime environment for your applications. Thank you. And uh, is there any more questions? Yes. So, do you use Spinnaker for to deploy and other more like infrastructure applications? Things that you would normally not have in a elastic auto scaling group. Yes, excellent question. The best example we have is Travis, actually, because uh, how does Travis or CI systems differ from regular applications? CI systems are very stateful, so. We have tasks in the CI system that can run for like two hours. So we use uh, Spinnaker deployments in combination with the Eureka integration in Spinnaker so that when you, when you uh, replace the Travis workers, it will launch the new ones, wait for them to come up. And when it shuts down the old ones, it will wait until the instances shut down by themselves uh, using Eureka to tell them that they should not pick tasks from the job, uh, from the queue. And then when they've finished all the running jobs, they will shut down and the deployment will be complete. So a deployment of, of Travis workers can take like one hour. It depends on the slowest build that is running. Yeah. Was that? The kind of, yeah, kind of yeah, and we have one more example is like you have some services that might uh, have to run all alone, right? They, they can't be two. And uh, that's quite simple to set up as well. So these kind of strange workflows 
that is not the common stateless application deploys works nicely as well because you're it has a rich interface and you can choose and create your own strategies and this stuff yes can you go back just one slide the def definition <laughs> <laughs> yeah. where is the definition of uh, Spinnaker, yeah or the definition like you you said it's uh, for microservices to run yeah yeah, the other. <laughs> I see that this is. Um, I think no, no, the the, the root source. Slides go to the. Uh, where is that? No, it's not here. Maybe well, whatever. Okay. The yeah. thing is, I see definition that on Spinnakers here is more for Kubernetes because Kubernetes can run microservices, but here it runs more advanced applications maybe than microservices, right? Uh, Spinnaker uh, is not I running mean, on Kubernetes. You're, you're VS Spinnaker. Yeah, case. Kubernetes is a uh, cloud you're running. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Spinnaker will integrate to it against it. <coughs> so Spinnaker will orchestrate the deployments and this kind of stuff. So it will not run anything. It's just telling so Kubernetes, Kubernetes what to run. Run microservices, right? Yeah. As well. But this one runs uh, my, uh, pipeline to. To control the clusters, yes. Right, yeah. So uh, Spinnaker would launch the new generations of your services to Kubernetes, mm -hmm. scale them up or down or whatever you want. Yeah. But it would not run them itself, yeah. I saw some crazy videos as well, like people on, on uh, I forgot the name, uh, what's it called? Uh, uh, they, they build Kubernetes uh, through uh, Spinnakers as well. Like they run the whole yeah. the clusters of Kubernetes and then, uh, you know what I mean? Yeah, that's very possible. If if you're running, let's say you're launching a Kubernetes cluster, you would, uh, or if I was to run a Kubernetes cluster, I would create it with a uh, pipeline and I would deploy to it to AVS and then I would make Spinnaker talk with uh, Kubernetes cluster running in AVS mm -hmm. and deploy applications on top of Kubernetes, yes. So it can handle all the layers. Yeah. Any more questions? No? no. So, okay, that was good. Uh, I would say that we uh, we give a very big uh, round of applause. Thank you.